Give him a warm welcome as he comes to share the word of God. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate it, brother. What a blessing. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much. Praise the Lord. Man, it's always a blessing to be here. You can be seated. Thank you. You know, I don't take it for granted uh, somebody turning their pulpit over to me. I pastored three little churches. None of them were like this. My largest church was 100. But uh, it was in a town of 144 people, so that wasn't bad. <laughs> but I know that, man, this is like their baby. They are shepherds for your souls and to allow somebody to come into their pulpit. I just really appreciate that. I respect Mac and Lynn and what they've done. And I think they were telling me 42 years they've been here. That's, a, that's nearly a miracle nowadays. So anyway, it's a great honor for me to be here and to share with you. Let me uh, mention some of my books here. I got some books I want to give away. We got a table out there someplace. And just real quickly, I've got a teaching on God wants you well. We've had a lot, a lot of people. Matter of fact, I was holding a conference on uh, healing is here is what we call it. And we had a woman come up during the teaching and laid her dead baby on the stage. He died and we prayed for him and he was raised from the dead through this teaching. So that was awesome. I'll let Paul give that to somebody that looks like you're nearly dead. You need healing. <laughs> and people still raise their hand. And this one is entitled, How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will. This is actually three teachings in one, and I combined them. And this is really the thing that God used to get my attention. When I was just in high school, I knew that God had a purpose for my life, and I didn't know how to get there. And I, I sought Him for about 18 months, and he, uh, that's the thing that really got my life going, was seeking God's will. God has a perfect plan for each one of us, and it's not enough just to find You've also got to figure out how to fo follow and then fulfill God's will. So Paul can give that to somebody that looks like you don't have a clue what your life's all about. And this book is entitled The Power of Imagination. And this is really a good teaching. I don't have time to explain it, but in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, it says, The Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. And the word for mind is Yetzer, Y-E-T-S-E-R. And the only definition of it in the Strong's is conception. Your mind is where you conceive. And that exact same word is the one that was used in Genesis 6, 5 when the Lord said that every imagination of his heart was only evil continually. Your imagination is where you conceive things. And in the same way as you don't have a child without conception, you don't have miracles without a conception. So that is really a good teaching. So Paul Milligan here, um, he's been a friend of mine for a very long time and been on my board for a very long time. Uh, he's a very successful businessman who has some of his corporations that he started on the New York Stock Exchange and has been really successful in he, he just, um, he was my CEO for six years and then he turned it over to a guy that he brought into the ministry, Billy Epperhart. And these two guys have just transformed our ministry and uh, I've been having him with me. I was uh, in Texas earlier in the week and then we were at our school this morning and um, I had him share because people don't understand that my vision has basically been the same. The anointing and the call that God placed on my life has been the same nearly since the beginning. But the thing that has just transformed is all of the natural things, the business sense, which is not my strong suit. And when uh, Paul came into our ministry as a board member in 1996, we had been turned over to bill collectors, collection agencies, all kinds of things. And he showed me one thing, a business thing, about just, just in time management is what's caused in business. And, you know, I've never been behind financially since then. And then he took over the ministry in 2014 and took us from, um, I think it was 325 employees to 650 employees in five years and now we're up over a thousand employees and we're just seeing awesome things happen all around the world and it's be 
and it's the business sense that has made a huge difference. And so, you know, I just wanted to say that. He's been a super blessing. I appreciate him. So let's turn over to Mark chapter 4. I'm going to preach on something that I guarantee you Mac and Lynn have taught on a hundred times, I'm sure. And I know that this is foundational, but um, there's uh, some things that the Lord showed me out of, not the one on the parable of the sower sowing the seed. They're very closely related. It's really a lot of the same principles, but it's the, the parable that Jesus gave in Mark chapter 4, verse 26. And the Lord showed me some things out of this that in just the last couple of years have made a huge difference in the way that I uh, understand and apply the Word of God uh, to my life. And so that's what I want to share with you. And I want to encourage you. I know you've heard a lot of these things, but don't ever get to where you think you got it all figured out. You know, the Scripture says over in 1 Corinthians chapter Eight, that if you think you know anything, then you know nothing yet, as you ought to know. One of the signs of maturity is when you realize how much you don't know. Amen. So please don't shut me off just because I'm using a passage of Scripture that I know you've heard ministered on. So here in Mark chapter 4, in verse 26, uh, he said, So is the kingdom of God as if a man should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day and the seed should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. But when the fruit is brought forth, immediately he putteth in the sickle because the harvest is come. And you know, there's, uh, you don't get, this only from reading Mark's account, but if you read all of the Gospels and put them together, there's actually 13 parables that Jesus taught in one day. And there's uh, four of them recorded right here in this one chapter. And they're all about the Word of God and how the Word of God works. And Mark chapter 4, verse 14 says, the sower sows the seed. So the seed is descriptive of the Word of God. The Word of God is the seed and the ground is our heart. The seed is an incorruptible seed, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. It says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the word of God that lives and abides forever. So the word of God is the seed. Our heart is the ground. And this is just talking about how the kingdom of God works. And for us to really receive from God, we've got to understand how the kingdom works. Or you could say... Uh, the laws of the kingdom. And uh, if you don't understand this, this is one of the reasons that people are frustrated not seeing the things of God. And let me just make this point before I move on. But the reason I think that the Lord chose a seed and sowing seed to illustrate the kingdom is because those are God-created laws. If he had used something like a physical system, a man-made system, say, for instance... School, you know, I've got a Bible college. We've got a Bible college here, and I was there today. It was really, really exciting to hear the testimonies about the people's lives being changed. But you can, you can cheat in a school. You can copy somebody else's test. You can cram for a harvest. You can not pay attention, and yet the night before a test, you can get in and just go over all the material and store it in your short-term memory, but you didn't really learn it. And I think all of us have proved that, that probably sometime in school, you just cram for a test. You may have passed, but today, if they gave you that test, you didn't know that stuff. You couldn't pass it today. So you can cheat a man-made system, but God's system has a system of, of seed, time, and then harvest, and you can't beat it. You've got to learn to cooperate with it. That's really significant. You can't thwart the way that God set the kingdom up. There are laws that govern the kingdom just as surely as there are laws that govern seed, time, and harvest. You know, I had a man in one of my uh, churches that got born again. He was the biggest sinner in the entire county. Everybody knew Billy Bob, and he was a bad dude. And when he got born again, he just started sharing his testimony with anything that would move, and he became the number one speaker on the full gospel businessman circuit. 
And because of that, he was traveling and ministering and doing things. And just a week or two before wheat harvest, he went and borrowed $500,000 to plant wheat. And he planted like five sections of wheat just a few weeks before harvest. And it didn't come up. And he was out $500,000 and the bill collectors were after him. And he came to me, what's wrong? I was out doing the Lord's business. I thought the Lord would just make this wheat come up. But see, there's laws. You can't wait until a week before harvest to sow. I don't care what you're doing. You can't break the laws. And many times Christians just think, well, I know I, I really don't know the word and I don't do this and that. But, you know, God, he can do anything. He can do anything but lie. And he said right here, I'm going to emphasize this a little bit more in a second, but he said there's the blade and then the ear and then the full corn in the ear. There are laws that govern how the kingdom of God operates and most Christians just are either ignorant or they ignore these laws and think, well, I'm in a desperate situation and God can do anything and I'm just expecting him to come through. That's not how it works. You know, I often compare this to electricity, that they have electricity in this building, and it runs the air conditioning, runs the light, runs the sound, runs a lot of things. But, you know, the electric company generates this electricity, but then they put it at your command. And if you want the electricity in this building on, you don't call the electric company and beg them to turn on your electricity. They generate the power, but they put it at your command and if you want the electricity on, you could call them, you could beg and say, we've got people coming tonight that this may be a life and death situation for them. We really need the electricity on. They won't come turn it on for you. They generate it, but it's at your command. This is what Isaiah 45, 11 says, concerning the works of my hands, command ye me. God generates the power. He's put this power on the inside of us but it's at our command and there are laws that govern how it's used and if you aren't aware of those laws, it'll keep you from benefiting. Did you know that electricity has been around since God created the heavens and the earth? He didn't just create electricity 200 years ago. He created electricity from the beginning, but man only learned the laws and learned how to use them a couple of hundred years ago and it's the same thing. Every one of us now probably has a cell phone. I was actually out in Uganda where they don't even wear clothes in one of these places, but they all had a cell phone. <laughs> it was unbelievable. Did you know that the laws that govern all of that have been here since day one, but people didn't benefit from it? Even when I was a kid, nobody would have ever thought that you could be talking on a phone that wasn't tied to a wall someplace. I remember being in Ireland and it took me three hours to get an overseas line to call back home to Jamie and I got three minutes and it cost me $62 for three minutes. And that's not been that long ago. Did you know that all of the things that we take for granted, those, those laws have been here all along, but our ignorance kept us from operating in them. Brothers and sisters, I'm saying this in love, but our ignorance as believers keeps us from receiving the benefit. So this is one of the things I get out of this parable is that there are laws that govern the kingdom in the same way in the natural realm that there are things you have to do. You can't cram for a harvest. You can't just automatically bypass all of these things. You've got to learn when is the time to plant and then how long it takes and then how to reap. There's a time to reap and this parable makes that same point that when the harvest is come, man, you got to reap. You can't, you can't go on vacation then and say, I'm going to reap at another time. You got to be sensitive enough to know when it's time to reap, when it's time to sow and when it's time to be patient and things like that. There's a lot in this parable. So in that uh, 26th verse, it just says that he should cast seed into the ground and should sleep and rise night and day. That implies that there is time Another thing that people do, they'll hear a message like this and they'll say, all right, I'm going to start sowing God's word in my heart. And so they'll make a commitment tonight and they'll spend tonight before they go to bed, they'll get into the word and then tomorrow morning they'll go dig it up to see, is it working? And you know what? If you dig a seed up to see if it's working, it'll never germinate. You got to leave it in the ground. There has to be faith that what I'm doing is working and you just have to trust that it's working. So uh, this implies that he sleeps and rises night and day 
And notice it says that it should spring and grow up. He knoweth not how. This is really important to me because uh, Paul Milligan, I was mentioning here just a minute ago, he introduced me last year, and the way he introduced me, he says, Andrew has never been accused of being the smartest person in the room. <laughs> he said that about me. <laughs> but it's true. And you know what? I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, and, and, but you don't have to know everything if you just take the basics and just believe it and operate in it. It says he didn't know how it works. You could take the cumulative knowledge of the entire human race, all of our resources, our brilliant minds, money, you could take everything, and they could produce something that looks like a seed, tastes like a seed, may have the exact same weight as a seed, but you put a man-made seed in the ground and it will never germinate. Nobody really understands a seed, but does that mean that we can't use them? No, we use them all the time. Did you know that you and I are the product of a seed? I'm not going to explain this. Hopefully everybody <laughs> understands what I'm talking about. But you and I are the product of a seed. Did you know everything you eat is a product of a seed, whether it's an animal or whether it's fruits, vegetables, all of it. The whole world is based on this principle of seeds. There wouldn't be life on this planet without seeds. Seeds are just essential to everything, and yet nobody understands exactly how it works, but we've learned how to use it, and life goes on because of this principle of seed, time, and harvest. You don't have to understand everything if you would just get the basics and just cooperate with it and put it into practice. I still don't understand how you can give everything away and get more back than what you had before you gave. I don't fully understand that, but I have put it into practice, and I'm seeing it come to pass. What Mac was talking about, about this Falcon 50 and stuff, I guarantee you, he's sown for that. There's reasons that things work. And there's people that'll see this and say, well, why doesn't God do that for me? Well, what have you sown? Don't ever criticize another person's harvest until you see how much seed they've put in the ground. Don't judge him by the amount of seed that you've sown. Amen. That's really good. So anyway, you don't have to understand it. And here's some of the things that I've just gotten a revelation on in the last few years. But it says in verse 28, it says, For the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. Notice, the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. Did you know that the phrase of herself is the Greek word automatos? And it's the word we get automatically from, or, or automatic. This says that the earth brings forth fruit automatically. It is just a law of God that if you put the seed of God's word in your heart, the earth brings forth fruit automatically. And then it goes on to say, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. So that shows you that there's a time, there's a growth process, but it's automatic. When you put a seed in the ground, did you know that that ground just instantly starts devouring that seed and breaking it down and releasing the miraculous stuff in it? And the ground doesn't care what kind of seeds put in it. You could plant weeds and the ground will produce weeds. You could uh, plant tomatoes or whatever it is that you want and the ground will just start bringing the life out of that seed. It just happens automatically. It's the same thing as when you plant a seed in a woman, when you have a physical relationship, it's just automatic. It's the way that God made us. This is how things work. It just works. And yet in the spiritual realm, there are people trying to reap a harvest or have a birth and they've never sown a seed. We would think a person today, if they were praying, you know, if they came forward and they said, please pray for me that I could have children. And I said, well, are you married? Oh, no. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm not going to pray that you have any children if you aren't married. But if, if you aren't married, if you aren't having a physical relationship with a man, you aren't going to have a child. I don't care how much you pray. 
You can have people lay hands on you until they rub all the hair off your head and you are not going to a, have a virgin birth. There was only one of those and you aren't going to be the second one. You got to have a seed planted. And we would think that a woman who's praying for a child and yet isn't planting a seed, you'd think, man, you're crazy. In the spiritual realm, people do it all of the time. I know that this is Saturday night I know that here you are, this isn't your typical Sunday morning nod to God crowd. You're the fanatics. And so I'm complimenting you for being here, but I can guarantee you there's people right in this auditorium that you're praying for a miracle and you haven't planted a seed. That is as foolish as a woman who's praying to get pregnant and yet hasn't planted a seed. And I've had some people say, well... Yeah, I mean, I believe the Word. Doesn't it say someplace? I can't remember if it's the Old or the New Covenant, but doesn't it say something like, uh, you know, by His stripes we are healed or were healed? That's like a woman standing next to a man and saying, is this close enough? <laughs> you need more intimacy than that to produce a birth. And likewise, just to say, doesn't the Bible say someplace? That, you know, that's, you haven't planted that seed in your heart. You have to have an intimate relationship. The Word of God has to come alive to you. You know, we use all kinds of words trying to describe this. We talk about a rhema word versus a logos word. And anyway, we could spend a lot of time on that. But the Word of God has to come alive in you. It can't be in just your head, in your memory. It's not just that you quote it. Has that word germinated on the inside of you? And I could spend all night long talking about this. I'm not going to do it. But man, I meditate on Scripture until it just comes alive on the inside of me. And you know, I never, I'm not against people who memorize Scripture, but I never memorize Scripture. And yet I can quote thousands and thousands of scriptures, not because I've memorized it, but because I take the word and I meditate on it until it germinates, until it comes alive on the inside of me. And once it becomes mine, I can quote it. Again, I'm not saying that everybody has to be able to, you know, give the address and everything. It's helpful to know the address of where everything is. But the Word of God has to come alive on the inside of you, not just something that you've read. That's like a woman saying, well, if I drink this water out of the same cup that somebody who's pregnant was, will that do it? No. You got to have, you got to be impregnated yourself. It's got to become yours. And so this says it happens automatically. And here's the thing that the Lord just, revealed to me that it has made a difference. Notice it says in verse 26 that the earth bringeth forth fruit of herself. The earth brings forth fruit. And I'm going to say something here that you may have to use your brain to understand. I hate to do that to you <laughs> because I know that most people come and they, it's like a cheerleading session and they just want to be encouraged and built up, but you might have to think in order to get this. But it would help you if you can get this. A seed doesn't, let me say it this way, an apple seed, does, it, it's, there isn't an apple tree in an apple seed. People will say things like this, and I've said it myself, and I understand what they're saying, but they'll say anybody can count the number of apple or the number of seeds in an apple, but no one can count the number of, of apples in a seed. And I understand what they're saying, but did you know technically that's not what this is saying? The seed does not produce a tree or fruit. It says the seed, the earth brings forth fruit of herself. The earth is what produces the thing. The seed is a catalyst. There is a miracle in a seed that takes what's in the ground, and the ground is what produces a tree. If you take an acorn, there isn't an oak tree in an acorn, but an acorn will take what's in the ground and activate it and bring it to life, and it will produce an oak tree. And I'm not going to take time. I'm just going to reference this. You go study it on your own. But in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, 
God created the heavens and the earth, and then on the third day, He let dry land appear. And then on the fourth day, He said, Let the earth bring forth fruit, and the earth bring forth grass, and the earth bring forth trees whose seed is in itself. And it was so. And then when He created the animals, He said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature. The earth brought forth all of these things. Now here's where you got to use your brain to think about this. But did you know that in ground, God created animals. It was in the dirt. The dirt brought forth, the seed was the sperm. Matter of fact, that verse that I've already quoted over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, where it says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but an incorruptible seed by the word of God that lives and abides forever. That word seed there is the Greek word spora. That's what we talk about a spore, how a spore pollinates a flower. And spora is a derivative of the word sperma, where we get the word sperm from. So the seed, God's word is the seed, but the ground is what's pregnant with everything. And right here it says that the earth brings forth fruit of herself. Notice the feminine. Today people are confused. Can't figure out which bathroom to go into and all you got to do is check your plumbing and whatever your plumbing is, that's who you are. Amen. I don't care how you feel. But this is speaking of the earth or the heart as being feminine. And you take the seed and you sow the seed in your ground, which when you get born again, you are born again with everything that you will ever need. The fullness of the Godhead is in Jesus. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 and verse 10 says you are complete in Him. Your spirit has everything in it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18 and 19 prays that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened so that we could see the hope of His calling, the exceeding greatness of His power towards us, the same power that He used when He raised Christ from the dead. You already have raising from the dead power on the inside of you. You've already got the mind of Christ. You've got joy unspeakable and full of glory. In your spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Everything you will ever need when you get born again is in you, but it's like a woman. You, you are the receptor. You have to have the seed of God's Word to make what is in you work. It's like the ground. Did you know when God created the ground? I had a guy introduce me one time, and he says, you are as plain as dirt. And he didn't mean that as a compliment. But now that I understand it, that's a great compliment. Dirt is miraculous. Did you know when God created the dirt and He let the dry land appear, did you know elephants were in the dirt? Everything was in the dirt. Did, here's another way of saying it. Did you know that everything that is above ground, everything that is above ground, everything that is above ground was at one time in the ground. There is not anything exist above ground that wasn't at one time in the ground. Did you know that the fabric, whatever they've used to make this carpet, it came from plants and stuff that came out of the ground? Did you know the steel, the bricks, the paint, anything? Did you know all the stuff that's in your phone? It's all came out of the ground. Skyscrapers, they're, they're made out of things that came out of ground. Sheetrock came out of the ground. You name it. It was all in the ground. Anything that the human race will ever need is already in the ground. This is one reason that I'm not a tree hugger that believes that we are in a critical state and that we're exhausting all of the resources. And that, that God thought through creation. And even after a fallen creation, everything that this world will ever need is already here. It just has to be developed and drawn out. I heard a report a couple of years ago that in it was either North or South Dakota, they found oil deposits, some of it in shale, 
but it dwarfs all of the rest of the oil deposits in the entire world. We've got enough oil in the United States to run the world at the rate we're using fossil fuels for over a hundred years just from this nation. And somebody's shut off our pipeline that, and the results are our prices are going through the roof. That's just dumber than a hammer. <laughs> but anyway, my point is there's no lack of anything. And if we ever got to where fossil fuels weren't it, well, there's other things. All you got to do is just figure out what God has intended. God isn't surprised by there being seven point something billion people on the planet. He thought all of this through, and I guarantee you there is enough resources here to take care of the human race if we get to where we have 14 billion people on this planet. People who are saying that we're running out of everything and that the earth is fragile are people that do not believe God created, that God was smart enough to anticipate what's happening, and they're just limiting God. I've got a guy on staff with me who has made an engine that he's run 100,000 miles on water. Water is the most abundant resource on this planet. He's working on trying to patent this thing and get it going. But I guarantee you, there is no shortage of anything. Everything that is above ground was once in the ground. Anything we will ever need is there. All it needs is a seed to impregnate it and bring it out. And so when God said, let the earth bring forth, he spoke words out of his mouth that was a sperm and it entered into that ground and out of it came giraffes and elephants and cows or anything, whatever. He created everything and it was the word that did it. God himself operates inside of the kingdom. A seed has to be sown. And the earth brings forth fruit of herself. You need to look at it as your born again spirit has everything in it that you will ever need. You've already got the wisdom of God. It says uh, that you have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2, 16. It says that you have an unction from the Holy One. You know all things, uh, 1, Tim, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. Everything you'll ever need is already in here, but you sow the seed of God's Word and it, you don't know how it works, but just automatically, automatically, the earth brings forth fruit of herself. Anything that you need, all you got to do is go to God's Word and find the seed that corresponds to your need. And you take that seed and you put it in your heart and you meditate in it day and night, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. And then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Everybody wants prosperity and success, but very few people will just go through the very simple things of taking God's word and meditating in it day and night. We're so busy watching as the stomach turns on the television. <laughs> and we got so many, you know, I've heard a report that we spend an average of four to five hours a day on a cell phone reading all the bad news and looking at the weirdness that's on there. And you say, I just don't have time to be in the Word. Man, throw your cell phone away and you get four or five hours right there every day that you could spend time in the Word. I'm not telling you to throw your cell phone away. If you use it properly, it's great. But I'm just saying that it's not the fact that we don't have time. It's the fact that we aren't motivated. If what I'm saying is true and if you have everything in Christ that you need. I keep pointing to my belly because the scripture says in John chapter 7, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the spirit. So your spirit, you know, I don't know if that's real or if it's just figurative, but your spirit's in your belly. Some of you look like you got more of the spirit than other people. <laughs> But you got everything here that you need. All you need is a seed. And the seed doesn't produce it by itself. The seed activates your born again spirit that already is complete in Christ and that has everything that you'll ever need. If this is true, which it is, then it's as simple as what do you need? Find a seed, plant that seed in your heart 
and leave it there and it will bring forth fruit of itself. This is a guarantee for healing, a guarantee for prosperity, a guarantee for joy, for peace, for anything. Many Christians think, well, God can do anything, but He just chooses who to heal and who to bless and who to do things. And, and it's random, and they look at it as just totally uh, God's decision. It's not that way at all. There are laws. There are reason that some people prosper. There are reason that some people walk in joy and peace and things like this. And it's not circumstances, and it's not genetics. I guess it's Holy Ghost genetics in the spirit realm. They've inherited those things, but they've learned how to put these laws into practice. Mac and Lynn, the reason that you see them succeeding and things happen is because they spend time in the Word of God. They've taken the Word of God and it's changed their life. And many Christians will see this and so they come and they want them to pray for them. And yes, we love you. And yes, they want to help you. And yes, they will pray for you. But why don't you do what they did? Well, they're the professionals. We pay them to do our believing for us. <laughs> I tell you, this is one of the big problems in the body of Christ is that we have people that are called clergy and then laity. And I understand what people mean by that. But brothers and sisters, there shouldn't be such a thing as some people who just have a special relationship with God and then others that don't. If you are born again, you have the exact same potential as Mac and Lynn and me and anybody else. You've got the exact same soil. But then I'm sure Mac has taught on all of this. You go into the previous parable about this and it talks about that there's afflictions and persecutions come that try and steal the word from you. And if you get to where you're constantly backing up on the word of God because it's costing you something, well, then that's going to choke the Word of God and you won't see it come to pass. I guarantee you, if you start standing on the Word of God, Satan is going to come immediately to steal away the Word that's been sown in your heart. If you never bump into the devil, it's because you're both headed in the same direction. You turn around and start following God, you are going to run into the devil. You are going to run into problems. And the purpose of it is to steal the Word of God from you, and you have to persevere through that. There's some people that'll see these principles that we're talking about, and they'll start, but the moment they get criticized for it, the moment you're going to be fired or something's happened because you didn't take a vaccine or because you didn't do what somebody else said, there's a lot of people that'll throw the Word right out the window and go ahead and do what they're told to do. I'm not against you taking vaccine, if that's what God tells you to do, but... Uh, there's many of you that don't feel that you should, and yet you just succumb to pressure and do things, and that's not right. I had a man come to me, and he was a male nurse, and he says, they're going to fire me if I don't get the vaccine. And I said, well, do you want the vaccine? He says, no, God told me not to take it. And I said, well, then you got your question answered. Don't take it. He says, but I'll lose my job. I'll lose my career. I said, what does that have to do with anything? If God tells you to do something, you do it. It doesn't matter if you lose your career. It doesn't matter if they lock you up. It doesn't matter what happens. If God tells you to do it, He's supposed to be Lord. You know, during COVID, we sued the government twice. They sued me twice. And they sent a cease and desist order, and we had plans in place in case they arrested me. And they said they were coming to arrest me, and people would take over and and stuff, but I didn't care. I mean, I don't want a jail ministry, but <laughs> I'm going to do what God tells me to do. It's not my response. You know, they just canceled us on YouTube for the sixth time, and they sent me an email today that says because it's been six times that we've been censored, uh, they may kick us off permanently. And they were asking me what to do. I said, look, I'm not going to self-censor. <laughs> they win if I do that. I'm going to keep speaking the truth. And if they censor me, let them censor me. <laughs> but I'm not going to self-censor. That's the tactic of the devil to bully you and stuff. You just do what God tells you to do. 
But see, there's some people that will start standing on the word, but if you get criticized for it, if they, if they start calling you a fanatic and start saying, hey, we don't talk about the Lord that way here at this job, your job could be in jeopardy. There's people that have just caved to that. You just pluck the seed up. Seed won't work for you. Afflictions and persecutions come to steal the seed. And then weeds are all of the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things. You can get so preoccupied with other things that you don't give time to the Word of God. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, not by having heard. You ha it has to be current. You have to be in the Word of God. It has to be constantly in you. It's as simple as what I'm talking about. You take the seed and you plant it in your heart and the earth, your heart, has everything in it just like the ground. Everything that we've ever seen above ground came out of the ground. Everything you need is there, but it has to have a seed to activate the ground. If you don't believe that, take a seed and put it in barren ground that's been depleted and there's no nutrients in it and that seed won't do a thing. The seed doesn't germinate by itself. The seed doesn't bring forth the fruit itself. The seed activates the ground. You are a new creation. What you have on the inside of you is absolutely miraculous. One of the translations of 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man's in Christ, he's a new species of being that never existed before. In your spirit, you are as miraculous as Jesus is. Everything that is true of Jesus is true of your spirit. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, as he is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. Not so are we going to be in the next world. We are right now. Now, that's not manifest in all of our lives yet, but in the spirit, you are identical to Jesus. You have his power, his mind, his anointing, his wisdom, his joy, his peace. You've got everything, but it has to have something to bring that out, and that's the seed is the Word of God, and it causes the earth to bring forth fruit of herself. It causes your spirit to release this supernatural power that's in it. Man, that is so powerful. And I can tell you that any good thing that has ever happened in my life is because of this principle. Because like I was saying when Paul introduced me as not being the smartest man in the room, uh, I'm a college dropout. I've never done anything exceptional in my life. But you know what? I was praying when the Lord really turned my life around and I just had a vision that God wanted me to have a ministry that reached people all over the world. And how in the world would that ever happen? I was an introvert. Couldn't even look at a person in the face and talk to them. Physically, I mean, in high school, I had somebody say hi to me on the street, and they were two blocks down the street before I said hi. <laughs> How is God going to use somebody like me to reach people all over the world? And I was praying and saying, God, how, what, how could this ever happen? And I remember just opening my eyes, and my Bible was laying on the bed in front of me, and I heard the Lord say, stick your nose in this book and don't take it out, and it'll do everything that you need. I didn't say it the way I'm saying it here tonight, but he was saying, that's my seed. If you'll just take this seed and put it in your heart, it'll work. And I can tell you, any good thing that has ever happened in my life is because of the seed of God's Word activating the life that was in me through Christ. And it's the same for every single person. It's not your physical flesh. It's not your natural self that produces Matter of fact, the Lord said in 1 Corinthians 1, 26, you see your calling, brethren, that not many mighty, not many noble after the flesh are called, but God hath chosen foolish things of the world, base things of the world, things that are despised, things that are nothing to bring to naught things that are, and the reason he did it was so that no flesh would glory in his presence. If you are a zero, if you are not anybody special, you are the prime candidate for this. Because that way God gets the glory. Nobody's going to look at me and think, well, it's Andrew's charisma that causes him to prosper. <laughs> Nobody's thinking that about me. 
I was in Chicago and a pastor had me stand up in a restaurant and start talking and the whole restaurant laughed at me for the way I talked. I'm telling you, you, it's not who you are in the flesh, it's not your education, it's not your gender, it's not your color of your skin, it's none of these things, it's who you are in Christ and all you got to do is take the seed and release that supernatural power. Man, that's awesome. That's awesome. There's some of you that look at Mac and Lynn and think I could never be like them. But you don't see who you are in Christ. You're only looking in the mirror. You're looking at all the warts and the gray hairs and the ugly and stuff like that. But it's not your flesh. It's your spirit, man. And in Christ, you've got everything that you could ever need. All you need is a seed of God's Word to bring it out. And you know, I need to come to a conclusion. The heart, I think it was uh, Kenneth Hagin that said, the heart cannot absorb more than the seat can endure. <laughs> but let me just point this out. It says it comes first the blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. In other words, it's, there's growth. And there are people that they want the benefit of the gospel, but they want it right now. And so they're going to try this, and they're going to pray or fast. You know, it's like going on a diet. There's people that want to control their weight through going on a diet. There's a reason that three-fourths of that word is die. <laughs> Diets actually hurt your body. Diets actually make your body think it's starving, and then when you start eating again, it piles on the pounds and stuff. They say that yo-yo diet's the worst thing you can do. But there's people, see, that will sit there and try and go on a diet for a week or something. They're going to really discipline themselves, but then they'll go back to eating junk food or eating too much or, or whatever. That's not the way you do it. It has to be a consistent thing you can't just go on a diet for a week and, and break your gluttony. That's what it is. You know what gluttony is? Eating more than you need, more often than you need it. That's gluttony. And you can be a skinny glutton. Anyway, that's another subject. I can tell that really went over well. But instead of going on a, on a crash diet and then going back to the way you were, it needs to be a lifestyle. It needs to be, this is just the way it is. And if you, if you eat less than your body needs and you do it for a long period of time, I guarantee you, you'll lose weight. That works for anybody. Just eat less than your body needs and you'll lose weight. You either increase what your body needs through exercise and stuff or decrease the amount of food or do both but it's real simple. Anybody can lose weight. I guarantee you, if you quit eating, you'll lose weight. <laughs> it works. And so you got to do it over a period of time. It needs to be a lifestyle instead of something you do. It's the same thing with the Word of God. You don't just go on a crash course where you fast and pray for a weekend and expect a miracle. No, there's a blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. It takes time, and there's growth in it. And people are impatient and they just, they need a miracle right now. You know, let me just deviate for a second and say that because it takes time to have the Word of God release the miraculous power that's in your spirit. That's the reason that God gave special gifts to the body of Christ, the gifts of healings and miracles and things like that, is because if the only way you could get healed is what I'm talking about right here, was to just take the Word of God and meditate in it. Maybe it takes a year for it to work. But if you were diagnosed with something and you're going to die in the next week, does that mean that those people just have to die? There's no, there's no way that they can receive? No, God gave special gifts to the body. And you can get healed off of the gift of miracles, the gift of faith, the gift of healings. And you can receive through other people, but that was never intended to be a substitute for you taking the Word of God and doing this. It's just a stopgap measure until you can get into the Word and develop 
And since God loves you, if you're in a crisis situation, you can come and let other people pray for you and God loves you and you can get healed. But that's actually detrimental if you substitute that for what God intended you to do. So this is this will work for everybody. And it just takes time. First the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. And this not only applies to healing, it applies to everything. Everything. Everything in the Christian life is a growth process. God's not going to take you from zero to a thousand miles an hour all at once. That's not acceleration. That's death. You'll die if you go from zero to a thousand. But if you'll accelerate, you can reach a thousand miles an hour if you accelerate into it gradually. If the Lord was just to take you from being totally non-productive to where all of a sudden everything is where it would destroy you. You wouldn't have the character and the maturity to be able to handle it. There's growth. God does that because He loves you. He doesn't want to give you more than you can handle. And He loves other people. He doesn't want to put all of this anointing and manifest it through you when you don't have the character to be able to sustain it. So there's a growth process. And it's going to take time for you to grow and mature and see these things come to pass. You know, I had a Bible college student that had been in a mental institution. He was 40-something years old when he came to school, and he had a special government grant to come to our Bible college. And he was a nice guy. I really liked the guy, but he had no social skills whatsoever. He would sit in the class and turn around and face the other students and pick his nose and just... He just had no social skills. He had been in a mental institution his whole life. But I liked the guy, and I felt like he had potential. So I took him, and after school, I started uh, just teaching him through the book of Proverbs. It says that the book of Proverbs is to make the simple have wisdom. So I started teaching him. And did you know after six months of teaching this guy, he came to me with a proposal, and there was a hotel in Manitou Springs that was built in the 1800s. It was a stone building that had over 100 rooms in it, but it had had a fire, and it was burned out and derelict, and the thing was condemned. And he went and found out how much they were selling that building for, how much it would cost to refurbish it and fix it up, and how much he could charge students in 100 rooms, what the income would be, and he was going to turn it into student housing. And he had this major proposal that he brought to me and showed it to me, and it was pretty impressive. And I complimented him, and I said, Jerry, this is really good that you're thinking this way, but... I can guarantee you this is not God. God does not want you to do this. And it's just like I popped his bubble. He just, why would you say something like that? He says, you've been telling me to believe God and all these things. And I said, it's because there's first a blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. I said, you have never worked a job in your life. You have never made one dime in your entire life. And this whole project was going to be $5 million. This has been 20 years ago. Probably be more than that now. You're going to believe all of a sudden for $5 million? You've never even managed your own money. And yet you're going to manage something that has, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars cash flow per month and do all of this. And you're going to oversee a construction project and you've never even cleaned your room? I said, I can guarantee you this is not how God does things. There has to be first a blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. And there are some of you that are believing for big things, and I'm praising God that you are, but have you been faithful in a small thing before you get bigger? Maybe you can't believe for the dead to be raised right now, but could you start believing for a cold? See, this is one of the criticisms I have against people that they basically just depend upon the medical profession, which I'm not against the medical profession. If it wasn't for doctors, all the Christians would be dead. They hadn't been believing God. So I'm not against doctors, but I'm saying, when are you going to trust God? Well, when it becomes incurable and the doctors send me home. Well, then it, you're going to have to come up with a little blade first. It may not be the full ear. You may not be to the point of seeing cancer healed. You're going to have to run to Mac and Lynn and let them pray for you because you've been goofing off and hadn't been sowing the word. When are you going to start believing? If you can't believe for a headache, how are you going to believe for a cancer? If you can't believe 
to get over your allergies and on and on. Again, I'm not saying that it's sin for you to depend upon doctors and stuff like that, but you've got to start exercising yourself. You don't start with lifting 500 pounds. You got to lift five pounds before you lift 500 pounds. You got to run a block before you run a mile. And yet most Christians are just depending upon all of the flesh stuff until it gets beyond man's ability and then you're going to tap into God. You're violating this principle of first the blade, then the ear, and then the full corn in the ear. You know, I just don't get sick. It's been 54 years. I've had two colds in 54 years, and that was because I abused my body. I'm not going to go into that, but I don't get sick. I don't believe in getting sick. You can't make me sick. And I know some of you think, well, that's an arrogant statement. Anyway, I hadn't got time to teach on this, but I don't get sick. I don't believe in getting sick. You can't make me sick. No germ can touch my body and live. I don't get sick. But I've been dealing with this for 54 years. I've been fighting. I fight a headache the way I would fight adultery. You can't make me commit adultery. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be sick any more than I'd commit adultery. Am I saying that you're sinning if you're sick? No, that's not what I'm saying. But I hate sickness as much as I hate adultery, lying, stealing, and I don't get sick. But I've been doing this for a long, long, long time. And some people see this and think, well, you, would you just pray for me that I'll do that? You've missed everything I've said. <laughs> that's not how it works. This is how it's been functioning in the body of Christ. Is you just come and impart it to me so that I can be carnal and yet still get spiritual results. That's not how it works. But if you will begin and start where you are, whatever it is that you're dealing with, start dealing with that and you'll grow and increase. And, and if you keep at it, you'll get to a place to where, praise God, no plague will come nigh your dwelling. That he'll turn off sickness on the inside of you. Exodus chapter 23, verse 25 You'll turn off sickness. You can get to where you don't get sick. Amen. I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. <laughs> I think you're weird to have these promises, and yet you just accept sickness, and well, it's flu season. There is no season that the Word of God doesn't work. Well, I'm getting older. Well, Moses was 120 years old and his natural force wasn't abated nor his eyesight dim. Why is it that we accept? Matter of fact, this is the reason we get sick is because we accept it. We've been programmed to be sick. We expect to be sick. You talk sick. You think sick. And even if you could find something good on the television to watch, the commercials would kill you. My wife and I don't watch a lot of TV, but when we do, we watch, uh, I don't know, Andy Griffith, Hogan's Heroes, something. And did you know all of those? Every commercial is on sickness because it's only old people that watch that stuff. <laughs> and so every commercial is sickness, and we have to sit there with the remote on, muting the thing. Because I'm not going to listen to somebody tell me that because I'm so old, I've got to have prostate cancer or something like that. I just don't listen to this stuff. Amen. So anyway, you may think I'm weird, but I think you're weird to sit here and just be like everybody else and be sick and poor and bummed out and discouraged. I don't do those kind of things. Amen. Praise God. So how many of you are sick and tired of being sick and tired? Man, if you're ready, if you, if you would just take the things I've talked about tonight and say, praise God, I am exactly like Jesus in my spirit. All I need is a seed to activate it and to bring it out. And you keep doing it over a prolonged period of time and you're going to see miraculous results. So, Father, we thank you and we receive the truth of your word. And, Father, I just pray that the Holy Spirit helps people to understand what I've talked about tonight. Father, I pray that you'd show every person in here their potential in the Spirit, what they have in the Spirit, and change their identity from all of the limitations of their flesh that they would see who they are in you. 
and that, Father, they would receive this truth and start taking the seeds that will draw out those miracles that are on the inside of them. Father, I pray that you'd burn these truths into their hearts so that they won't get over it. That people would start applying this. And Father, we thank you for it. I believe that you are doing that and that this is going to cause miraculous results. So Father, we thank you for it and we agree and receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If there's anybody here who doesn't know Jesus, then all of the things that I've said about you, your ground has been corrupted and it's incapable of bringing forth all the miraculous results that I'm talking about. You need new ground. That's what the Bible says. You have to be born again. You need a new spirit. And so if you've never made Jesus your personal Lord, it's not about just coming down and joining a church or or saying now you're a Christian, or getting baptized. It's about being changed in your spirit. If you've never experienced this change, then you need to experience that. And it's as simple as just acknowledging that you can't save yourself, that you need a Savior, and you make Jesus your Lord. That's what it says in Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So that's all there is. Jesus has paid for everything. Are you going to receive it? And once you get born again, then Jesus told those who had already been born again, don't go anywhere, don't tell anybody, don't do anything until you receive power from on high, which was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues, these men who had just run and hid became bold, strong, so much so that they said they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I guarantee you, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the second most important thing you can ever receive. So if you've already been born again, but if you haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you need to receive that tonight. And... Uh, there's just so much more. But those two things are absolutely essential for you to even begin where I'm talking about tonight. This is what makes your ground good ground. And so this is a starting place. Is there anybody in here tonight who would say, I need either one or both of those. I either need to make Jesus my Lord or I'm already born again, but I don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand so I can pray with you. There's people all over the place number of people. Praise God. Amen. Well, we love you and we want to help you to receive. And so let me ask that if you raised your hand or if you were supposed to raise your hand but didn't do it, would you just come down here and let us pray with you? We aren't going to do anything other than just pray for you and help you to receive. But if you raised your hand or were supposed to raise your hand, come down here. We aren't asking you to join this church. This is a great church. You need a church. But this is just about your personal relationship with the Lord. Praise the Lord. Awesome. I tell you, this will change your life. Praise God. If you're coming down from the balcony, please keep coming. We'll wait on you, but we want you to come and receive. Praise the Lord. Isn't this awesome? Praise God. Man, I don't know how you made it this long without being born again and or baptized in the Holy Spirit. I tell you, life is tough. And if you don't have the power of the Holy Ghost working in you, it's, it's hard. It's hard. Praise God. So is, is there anyone down here who's not certain that you've already been born again? I'm going to pray for these to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but Jesus said He's the one that gives the Holy Spirit. You have to receive the giver before you receive the gift. 
If you have not been born again, I need to pray with you first before you can receive this baptism of the Holy Spirit. So these two men right here raised your hands that you need to be born again. Here's, here's two more. Here's another one. Anybody else that you aren't sure if you've been born again or not? Are you sure? If you were to die right this moment and stood before God, do you know for sure that you're born again? I'm not trying to talk you out of anything, but you just got to be sure. There's a lot of people that just say, well, I hope so. Man, you can't base your eternity on you hope so. The Bible says that when you get born again, you know you pass from death unto life. Is there anybody who's not sure? We've got five people here I'm going to be praying with. Anybody else? Here's two more. Praise God. Awesome. All right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pray a real simple prayer. I'd like to ask you to repeat it after me, and I'd like to ask everyone in here to pray this prayer just so that they won't think that we're listening only to them. And it's not like this is automatic. It's not magic. But I'm going to pray similar things to what the Scripture says you need to do. And if you will pray this after me and mean it from your heart, then you'll be born again. Because the Bible says Jesus has already paid for your sins. It's not a matter of will He forgive you. He has forgiven you. It's a matter of will you receive His forgiveness. And if you'll do that, it says, Whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you a whosoever? Amen. I believe it's going to work. So let's everybody pray this. Just say, Father, I'm sorry for my sin. I believe Jesus died to forgive my sin. And I receive that forgiveness. Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. I believe that you are alive. That you now live in me. I am saved. I am forgiven name of Jesus. You believe that? You believe that? Awesome. Well, welcome to the family. You know, if you prayed that and believe, the Bible says you have to pray and believe. And if you believe that, then according to scriptures, you just changed. Not on the outside. If you were a man, you're still a man. If you're a woman, you're still a woman. But on the inside, you are a brand new person. And the Bible says, the Bible says that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So everybody down here has now made Jesus your Lord. And according to scripture, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He created you to be a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. That's what you were made for. So I'm trying to emphasize that God wants to fill you with His Holy Spirit more than you want to be filled. You don't have to beg. You don't have to plead. Some people think you've got to get rid of all of the sin in your life. If there's any problem in your life, God won't fill a dirty vessel. I'm telling you, God hadn't got any other kind of vessel to fill. <laughs> We're all in some degree of doing things wrong. If you could get totally free and healthy and whole all on your own, you wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is sent to help you to overcome these things. So don't let any feelings of unworthiness stop you. It says in uh, Luke eleven thirteen, 13, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So all you got to do is ask. And so we're going to just open up the doors of our temple and welcome the Holy Spirit. He won't force himself in. You have to invite him. We're going to invite the Lord to come into our life and I'm going to pray over you and you are going to believe what the Word says that if you ask, you receive. And God is going to give you the Holy Spirit. And I hadn't got time to go into this. I think I have books on this. Usually we send books uh, that, so we have those books out there. I've got enough books to give each one of you a book that will explain what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is about. But uh, part of it is speaking in tongues. In the Bible, when they received the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. That's not all that there is to it, but it's one of the immediate things that happens. And so we're going to pray. We're going to welcome the Holy Spirit. And then those of us that have this gift of speaking in tongues, we're just going to start worshiping the Lord and speaking in tongues, just like we did during praise and worship. And when we do, 
you quit praying in English and start praying in tongues with us. And I know some of you are thinking, well, how do I do that? What do I do? This book will explain it. But let me just quickly say that the thing that hindered me, I prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I received and it changed my life. I was instantly a different person, but it took me three and a half years before I spoke in tongues and that's because I was a Baptist. <laughs> and I'd been told that this was of the devil and I thought I was just afraid that it was gonna be me. You know what, it was me. It was me under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and I was just waiting on God to make me talk. And it doesn't happen that way. It's similar to the way I taught tonight. I believe God spoke through me, but he didn't take my mouth and make it talk. That's the reason it came out in Texan. It's because it was me talking, but I believe it was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues is like that. It says in Acts 2, 4, they spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. So I'm gonna pray for you, we're gonna believe, we're gonna receive, and then those of us that have this gift are gonna just start worshiping the Lord. And as we worship the Lord, you just choose to pray with us. And if you don't know what to say, you can try and say what you hear somebody else saying, but it'll, it'll be different. Your tongue will be unique to you. And don't worry, it's like a little baby when they first talk. It may not sound like they're saying, Daddy, but boy, that daddy knows what that child is trying to say. Your heavenly father is hearing your heart. And if, if you're self-conscious, it may hinder you at first, but you just forget yourself and go to worshiping God. The Bible says you're bypassing your brain. You're praying straight out of your spirit and it'll just set you free. It'll edify you is what the Bible says when you pray in tongues. So this is what we're going to do. And you are going to speak in tongues tonight. The Bible said, believers will speak in new tongues. I want you to say, I'm a believer. I'm a believer. And I will speak in tongues. Let's everybody stand up and let's pray with them. And then when we believe that they receive, let's everybody start worshiping the Lord with them. And I believe that these are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You're going to be stronger than horseradish. Amen. Praise God. Father, we love you. Thank you, Father, for the great miracle of seeing people born again. Father, we thank you for these seven that received salvation that made you their Lord. Thank you, Father, and thank you that all of us now are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that this is what you created us for, is to come and live in us and dwell in us. And so, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We open up the doors of our temple and Holy Spirit, come and fill us right now with your power from one end of this line to the other end. I just release this anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon every one of these in Jesus' name. I want you to put your hands up like this, like when somebody sticks a gun in your back and you go, I surrender. This is your way of surrendering to your spiritual antennas. Father, we just receive right now in the mighty name of Jesus and we thank you that we are now filled with the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Start thanking God for giving you the Holy Spirit. Don't go by how you feel. Go by what you believe. Father, we believe your word. We believe we're filled. Now, those of you who know how to pray in tongues, let's worship the Lord and speak in tongues. And as we speak in tongues, you just join in with us. Amen. Quit speaking in English and let's speak in tongues. Hallelujah. You can't talk in tongues with your mouth closed. You got to open your mouth. That's no problem. In the name of Jesus, we command this healing, this throat to be healed. Speak. I prayed with a man who was dumb, couldn't speak at all, and he started praying in tongues. You can do it, brother. Just be bold. Talk right now. You got to open your mouth to talk in tongues. You got to quit talking in English or a known language. Don't worry about what it sounds like. Do it by faith. That's one of the reasons speaking in tongues is so powerful is because it doesn't make sense to your natural mind. You're, you have to flow out of your spirit. It's a gift of faith. 
Tita rasolo na mokor la din ki pitere prosateri abrando lumaha. Don doro kubri asembi baramba. And you can put some emotion into it. It doesn't have to be monotone. You can go kora simba hatte i eda mahraiti kataramba roso. Bota tingili e boharo samba ramba dia. Just speak. Don't shake your head. No, shake it. Yes. Many of these are speaking in tongues right now. That's the power of God. Just speak right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let me have your attention for a minute. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you know, whether you spoke in tongues or not, I believe God gave you the Holy Spirit because He promised that He would. But speaking in tongues is really important. I'm not speaking in tongues right now, and yet I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. You have to choose to do this, and sometimes we've got so much religion in us and things that hinder us that's the reason I made this book, and this book will explain all of these things. I don't think anybody ever had any more problems speaking in tongues than I did, and yet, man, I can pray in tongues with the best of them now. And so I want to give each one of you a free copy of this book. I don't know how to do this, but we have it out there someplace. It's entitled The New You Slash Holy Spirit. And for those of you that did not come forward and you want to go get this free book, God knows... <laughs> All of you who came down front, you can go out there and ask for that, and they'll give you a free copy of that. Actually, everything I've got, you can take all of it. It's all free if you want it, and, uh, and it'll be a blessing to you. So thank you for this. I believe that your life is never going to be the same. Amen? <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Thank you. You can go back to your seats. And Mac, I'm going to turn it back over to you. And I know that there's probably other people here that need prayer or something else. But I think that uh, Living Word here has a prayer team. And yep. we'd invite you to come. I'll let Mac. Yes, we uh, do. Y'all give, give the Lord a shout for this tonight. Let me thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Amen. 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 Well, listen. Uh, tomorrow is a new day. I mean, I know you came tonight. Nothing to say, you can't come to another service tomorrow. But when the Spirit of God is moving, you ought to want to be where He is. Amen? Thank you so much for being a part of everything tonight. Uh, we love you. I'm glad to see you again. And I look forward to hanging around for a while. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. And we'll perhaps see you tomorrow. Amen.
Yeah.